ideas of the world which are built into the very nature of the language we use and of our ideas of logic and of what makes sense altogether. And these basic ideas I call myth, not using the word myth to mean simply something untrue, but to use the word myth in a more powerful sense. A myth is an image in terms of which we try to make sense of the world. And we at present are living under the influence of two very powerful images, which are in the present state of scientific knowledge inadequate. And one of our major problems today is to find an adequate, satisfying image of the world. Well, that's what I'm going to talk about. And I'm going to go further than that, not only what image of the world to have, but how we can get our sensations and our feelings in accordance with the most sensible image of the world that we can manage to conceive. All right, now, the two images which we have been working under for 2,000 years and maybe more are what I would call two models of the universe, and the first is called the ceramic model and the second the fully automatic model the ceramic model of the universe is based on the book of Genesis from which Judaism Islam and Christianity derive their basic picture of the world and the image of the world in the book of Genesis is that the world is an artifact it is made as a potter takes clay and forms pots out of it or as a carpenter takes wood and makes tables and chairs out of it don't forget Jesus is the son of a carpenter and also the son of God so the image of God and of the world is based on the idea of God as a technician potter carpenter architect who has in mind a plan and who fashions the universe in accordance with that plan so basic to this image of the world is the notion you see that the world consists of stuff basically primordial matter substance stuff as pots are made of clay and the potter imposes his will on it and makes it become whatever he wants and so in the book of Genesis the Lord God creates Adam out of the dust of the earth in other words he makes a clay figurine and then he breathes into it and it becomes alive because the clay becomes informed by itself it is formless, it has no intelligence and therefore it requires an external intelligence and an external energy to bring it to life and to put some sense into it. And so in this way we inherit a conception of ourselves as being artifacts, as being made and it is perfectly natural in our culture for a child to ask its mother how was I made or who made me and this is a very very powerful idea but for example it is not shared by the Chinese or by the Hindus a Chinese child would not ask its mother how was I made a Chinese child might ask its mother how did I grow which is an entirely different procedure from making. You see, when you make something, you put it together, you arrange parts, or you work from the outside to the in, as a, as a sculptor works on a stone or as the potter works on clay. But when you watch something growing, it works in exactly the opposite direction. It works from the inside to the outside. It expands. It burgeons, it blossoms, 
and it happens all over itself at once. In other words, the, the, the original simple form, say, of a, of a living cell in the womb, progressively complicates itself. And that's the growing process. And it's quite different from the making process. And so there is, for that reason, a fundamental difference between the maid and the maker. And this image, this ceramic model of the universe, originated in cultures where the form of government was monarchical. And where, therefore, the maker of the universe was conceived also at the same time in the image of the king of the universe. King of kings, lord of lords, the only ruler of princes, who dost from thy throne behold all dwellers upon earth. I'm quoting the Book of Common Prayer. And so all those people who are oriented to the universe in that way feel related to basic reality as a subject to a king. And so they are on very, very humble terms in relation to whatever it is that works all this thing. I find it odd in the United States that people who are citizens of a republic have a monarchical theory of the universe. Because we are carrying over from the very ancient Near Eastern cultures the notion that the Lord of the universe must be respected in a certain way. People kneel, people bow, people prostrate themselves. Because, the, and you know what the reason for all that is, that nobody is more frightened of everybody else than a tyrant. He sits with his back to the wall and his guards on either side of him. And he has you face downwards on the ground because you can't use weapons that way. When you come into his presence, you don't stand up and face him because you might attack. And he has reason to fear that you might because he's ruling you all. And the man who rules you all is the biggest crook in the bunch. Because he's the one who succeeded in crime. The other people are pushed aside because they, the criminals, the people we lock up in jail, are simply the people who, who didn't make it. <laughs> so naturally, uh, the real boss sits with his back to the wall and his henchman on either side of him. And so when you design a church, what does it look like? Catholic church with the altar as it used to be. It's changing now because the Catholic religion is changing. But the Catholic church has the altar with its back to the wall at the east end of the church. And uh, there the altar is the throne and the priest is the chief vizier of the court and he is making obeisance to the throne in front but there is the throne of God, the altar and uh, all the people are facing it and kneeling down <coughs> and a great Catholic cathedral is called a basilica from the Greek basileus which means king so a basilica is the house of a king and the ritual of the Catholic Church is based on the court rituals of Byzantium a Protestant church is a little different, but basically the same. The furniture of a Protestant church is based on a judicial courthouse. The pulpit. The judge in an American court wears a black robe. He wears exactly the same dress as a Protestant minister. And everybody sits in these boxes. Like there's a jury box, there's a box for the judge, there's a box for this, a box for that. And those are the pews in an ordinary kind of colonial type Protestant church. So both these uh, kinds of churches, which have an autocratic view of the nature of the universe, decorate themselves, are architecturally constructed in accordance with political images of the universe. One is the king and the other is the judge, your honor. There's sense in this. Uh, when in court you have to refer to the judge as your honor, it stops the people engaged in litigation from losing their tempers and getting rude. There's a, there's a certain sense to that. But when you 
want to apply that image to the universe itself, to the very nature of life, it has limitations. For one thing, the idea of a difference between matter and spirit. This idea doesn't work anymore. Long, long ago, physicists stopped asking the question, what is matter? They began that way. They wanted to know what is the fundamental substance of the world. And the more they asked that question, the more they realized they couldn't answer it. Because if you're going to say what matter is, you've got to describe it in terms of behavior. And that is to say in terms of form, in terms of pattern. You tell what it does. You describe the smallest shapes of it that you can see. Atoms, electrons, protons, mesons, all sorts of sub-nuclear particles. But you never, never arrive at the basic stuff. Because there isn't any. What happens is this, stuff is a word for the world as it looks when our eyes are out of focus, fuzzy. Stuff, the idea of stuff is that it's undifferentiated as some kind of a goo. Hmm? And when your eyes are not in sharp focus, everything looks fuzzy. When you get your eyes into focus, you see a form, you see a pattern. And so all that we can talk about is patterns. So the picture of the world in the most sophisticated physics of today is not formed stuff, potted clay, but pattern. A self-moving, self-designing pattern, a dance. And we haven't yet, our common sense as individuals hasn't yet caught up with this. Well now, in the course of time, in the evolution of Western thought, the ceramic image of the world ran into trouble and changed into what I call the fully automatic model or image of the world. In other words, Western science was based on the idea that there are laws of nature. And it got that idea from Judaism and Christianity and Islam. That, in other words, the potter, the maker of the world, in the beginning of things, laid down the laws. And the, the law of God, which is also the law of nature, is called the Logos. And uh, in Christianity, the Logos is the second person of the Trinity, incarnate as Jesus Christ, who thereby is the perfect exemplar of the divine law. So we have tended to think of all natural phenomena as responding to laws, as if, in other words, the laws of the world were like the rails on which a streetcar or a tram or a train runs. And these things exist in a certain way, and all events respond to these laws. You know that limerick, there was a young man who said, Damn, for it certainly seems that I am a creature that moves in determinate grooves. I'm not even a bus, I'm a tram. <laughs> <laughs> so, here's this idea that there's a kind of a plan, and everything responds and obeys that plan. Well, in the 18th century, Western intellectuals began to suspect this idea. And what they suspected is whether there is a lawmaker, whether there is an architect of the universe. And they found out, or they reasoned, that you don't have to suppose that there is. Why? Because the hypothesis of God does not help us to make any predictions.
In other words, let's put it this way. If the business of science is to make predictions about what's going to happen, science is essentially prophecy. What's going to happen? By studying the behavior of the past and describing it carefully, we can make predictions about what's going to happen in the future. That's really the whole of science. And to do this and to make successful predictions, you do not need God as a hypothesis because it makes no difference to anything. If you say everything is controlled by God, everything is governed by God, that doesn't make any difference to your prediction of what's going to happen. And so what they did was simply drop that hypothesis. But they kept the hypothesis of law. Because if you can predict, if you can study the past and describe how things have behaved, and you've got some regularities in the behavior of the universe, you call that law. Although it may not be law in the ordinary sense of the word, it's simply regularity. And so they, what they did was they got rid of the lawmaker and kept the law. And so they conceived the universe in terms of a mechanism. Something, in other words, that is functioning according to regular clock-like mechanical principles. Newton's whole image of the world is based on billiards. The atoms are billiard balls and they bang each other around. And so your behavior, you, every, every individual therefore is defined as a very, very complex arrangement of billiard balls being banged around by everything else. And so behind the fully automatic model of the universe is the notion that reality itself is, to use the favorite term of 19th century scientists, blind energy. In, say, the metaphysics of Ernst Haeckel and T.H. Huxley, the world is basically nothing but blind, unintelligent force. And likewise, in parallel to this, in the philosophy of Freud, the basic psychological energy is libido, which is blind lust. And it is only a fluke, it is only as a result of uh, pure chances that resulting from the exuberance of this energy, there are people with values, with reason, with languages, with cultures, and with love. Just a fluke. Like, you know, 1,000 monkeys typing 1,000 typewriters for a million years will eventually type the Encyclopedia Britannica. And of course, the moment they stop typing the Encyclopedia Britannica, they will relapse into nonsense. And so in order that that shall not happen, because you and I are flukes in this cosmos, and we like our way of life, we like being human, if we want to keep it, say these people, we've got to fight nature because it'll turn us back into nonsense the moment we let it. And so we've got to impose our will upon this world as if we were something completely alien to it from outside. And so we get a culture based on the idea of the war between man and nature. And we talk about the conquest of space, the conquest of Everest, and the great symbols of our culture are the rocket and the bulldozer. The rocket, you know, compensation for the sexually inadequate male. Uh, <laughs> so we're going to conquer space. You know, we're in space already, way out. If anybody cared to be sensitive and let what's outside space come to you, you can if your eyes are clear enough aided by telescopes, aided by uh, radio astronomy, aided by all the kind of sensitive instruments we can devise. We are as far out in space as we're ever going to get. But, uh, you know, sensitivity isn't the pitch. In, in the, especially in the WASP culture of the United States, we define manliness in terms of aggression. You see, because we are not, we're a little bit frightened as to whether we are really men. And so we put on this great show of being 
a tough guy. Uh, it's completely unnecessary. Uh, it, it, you know, if you have what it takes, you don't need to put on that show. You don't need to beat nature into submission. Why be hostile to nature? Because after all, you are a symptom of nature. You, as a human being, you grow out of this physical universe in just exactly the same way that an apple grows off an apple tree. So let's say the tree which grows apples is a tree which apples, using apple as a verb. And a world in which human beings arrive is a world that peoples. And so the existence of people is symptomatic of the kind of universe we live in. Just as spots on somebody's skin are symptomatic of chickenpox. But we have been brought up by reason of our two great myths, the ceramic and the fully automatic. Not to feel that we belong in the world. So our popular speech reflects it. We say, I came into this world. You didn't, you came out of it. We say, face facts. We talk about encounters with reality, as if it was a head-on meeting of completely alien agencies. And the average person has the sensation that he is a somewhat that exists inside a bag of skin, a center of consciousness, which looks out at this thing and what the hell is it going to do to me? You see? Uh, I recognize you, you kind of look like me, and uh, I've seen myself in a mirror, and uh, y you look like you might be people. <laughs> So maybe you're intelligent, maybe you can love too. And uh, maybe perhaps you're all right. Some of you are anyway. If you've got the right color of skin or you have the right religion or whatever it is, you're okay. But there are all those people over in Asia, Africa, and they may not really be people. When you want to destroy someone, you always define them as unpeople, not really human. Monkeys may be, idiots may be, machines may be, but not people. But we have this hostility to the external world because of the superstition, the myth, the absolutely unfounded theory that you yourself exist only inside your skin. Now, I want to propose another idea altogether. And other astronomers either say there was a primordial explosion, an enormous bang millions of years ago, billions of years ago, which flung all the galaxies into space. Well, let's take that just for the sake of argument and say that was the way it happened. It's like uh, you took a bottle of ink and you threw it at a wall. <laughs> Smash, and all that ink spreads. And in the middle, it's dense, isn't it? And as it gets out on the edge, the little droplets are finer and finer and make more complicated patterns. See? So in the same way, there was a big bang in the beginning of things and it spread. And you and I, sitting here in this room, as complicated human beings, are way, way out on the fringe of that bang. We are the complicated little patterns on the end of it. Very interesting. But so we define ourselves as being only that. If you think that you are only inside your skin, you define yourself as one very complicated little curly cue, way out on the edge of that explosion, way out in space and way out in time. Billions of years ago, you were a big bang. But now you're a complicated human being. And when then we cut ourselves off <coughs> like this and don't feel that we are still the big bang. But you are. Depends how you define yourself. You are actually, if, if this is the way things started, if there was a big bang in the beginning, you're not something that is a result of the Big Bang on the end of the process. You are still the process. You are the Big Bang, the original force of the universe coming on as whoever you are. See, when I meet you, I see not just what you define yourself as, Mr. So-and-so, Miss So-and-so, Mrs. So-and-so. I see every one of you as the primordial energy of the universe coming on at me in this particular way. I know I'm that too. But we've learned to define ourselves as separate from it. 
And so what I would call a kind of a basic problem we've got to go through first is to understand that there are no such things as things. That is to say, separate things or separate events. That that is only a way of talking. And if you can understand this, you're going to have no further problems. <laughs> I once asked a group of high school children, what do you mean by a thing? And first of all, they gave me all sorts of synonyms. They said, it's an object, which is simply another word for a thing. It doesn't tell you anything about what you mean by a thing. And finally, a very smart girl from Italy who was in the group said, a thing is a noun. And she was quite right. A noun isn't a part of nature, it's part of speech. There are no nouns in the physical world. There are no separate things in the physical world either. See, the physical world is wiggly. The clouds, mountains, trees, people are all wiggly. And uh, only when human beings get working at things, they <coughs> build buildings in straight lines and try and make out that the world isn't really wiggly. But here are we sitting in this room all built on straight lines, but each one of us is as wiggly as all get out. <laughs> now then, when you uh, want to get control of something that wiggles, it's pretty difficult, isn't it? You try and pick up a fish in your hands and the fish is wiggly and it slips out. What do you do to get hold of a fish? You use a net. And so the, the net is the basic thing we have for getting hold of the wiggly world. And so if you want to get hold of this wiggle, you've got to put a net over it. And I can number the holes in a net. So many so holes up, so many holes across. And if I can number these holes, I can count exactly where each wiggle is in terms of a hole in that net. And that's the beginning of calculus the art of measuring the world. But in order to do that, I've got to break up the wiggle into bits. And I've got to call this a specific bit, and this the next bit of the wiggle, and this the next bit, and this the next bit of the wiggle. And so these bits are things or events. Bits of wiggles, which I mark out in order to talk about the wiggle, in order to measure it, and therefore in order to control it. But in nature, in fact, in the physical world, the wiggle isn't bitted. Like you don't get a cut up fryer out of an egg. <laughs> but you have to cut the chicken up in order to eat it. You bite it, but it doesn't come bitten. So the world doesn't come thinged, it doesn't come evented. You and I are all as much continuous with the physical universe as a wave is continuous with the ocean. The ocean waves and the universe peoples. And as the wave, I wave at you and say, you, the world is waving at me with you and saying, uh, hi, I'm here. But we, our consciousness, are the way we feel and sense our existence, being based on a myth that we are made, that we are parts, that we are things, our consciousness has been influenced so that each one of us does not feel that. We feel we have been hypnotized, literally hypnotized by social convention into feeling and sensing that we exist only inside our skins, that we are not the original bang, but just something out on the end of it. And therefore we are scared stiff. Because my wave is going to disappear. And I'm going to die. And that would be awful. We've got a mythology going now, which as uh, Father Maskell put it, we are nothing but something that happens between the maternity ward and the crematorium. <laughs> and that's it. And therefore everybody feels unhappy and miserable. No. This is what people really believe today. You may go to church, you may say you believe in this, that and the other, but you don't. Even Jehovah's Witnesses, who are the most fundamentalist fundamentalists, they are polite when they come round and knock at the door. <laughs> but if you really believed in Christianity, you would be screaming in the streets. But nobody does. 
you'd be taking full-page ads in the paper every day. You'd have the most terrifying television programs. The churches would be going out of their minds if they really believe what they teach, but they don't. They think they ought to believe what they teach. They believe they should believe, but they don't believe it because what we really believe is the fully automatic model. And that is our basic plausible common sense. You are a fluke. You are a separate event. And you run from the maternity ward to the crematorium and that's it, baby. That's it. Now, why does anybody think that way? There's no reason to, because it isn't even scientific. It's just a myth. And it's invented by people who wanted to feel a certain way. They want to play a certain game. See, the game of God got, em got embarrassing. The, the idea of God as the potter, the architect of the universe, is, is, is good. And, it makes you feel that life is, after all, important. There is someone who cares. It has meaning, it has sense, and you are valuable in the eyes of the Father. But after a while, it gets embarrassing. And you realize that everything you do is being watched by God. <laughs> he knows your tiniest, inmost feelings and thoughts, and you say after a while, quit bugging me. <laughs> I don't want you around. So you become an atheist just to get rid of it. Then, then you feel terrible after that because you got rid of God, but that means you got rid of yourself. You're just nothing but a machine. And your idea that you're a machine is just a machine too. So if you're a smart kid, you commit suicide. Camus said there is only really one serious philosophical question, which is whether or not to commit suicide. I think there are four or five serious philosophical questions. The first one is, who started it? The second is, are we going to make it? The third is, where are we going to put it? The fourth is, who's going to clean up? And the fifth, is it serious? <laughs> But, but still, uh, should you or not commit suicide? This is a good question. Why go on? And you only go on if the game is worth the candle. Now, the universe has been going on for an incredible long time. And so, really, a, a satisfactory theory of the universe has to be one that's worth betting on. That's a very, it seems to me, absolutely elementary common sense. If you make a theory of the universe which isn't worth betting on, why bother? Just commit suicide. But if you want to go on playing the game, you've got to have an optimal theory for playing the game. Otherwise, there's no point in it. But the people who coined the fully automatic theory of the universe were playing a very funny game. What they wanted to say was this, all you people who believe in religion are old ladies and wishful thinkers. You've got a big daddy up there and you want a comfort and thing, but life is rough. Life is tough and uh, success goes to the most hard-headed people. That was a very convenient theory when the European American world was colonizing the natives everywhere else. They said, we are the end product of evolution and uh, we are tough. See, I'm a big strong guy because I face facts and life is just a bunch of junk and I'm going to impose my will on it and turn it into something else, you see. And I'm real hard. See, that's a way of flattering yourself. And so uh, it has become academically plausible and fashionable that this is the way the world works in academic circles, no other theory of the world than the fully automatic model is respectable. Because if you're an academic person, you've got to be an intellectually tough person. You've got to be prickly. See, there are basically two kinds of philosophy. One's called prickles, the other's called goo. <laughs> and uh, prickly people are precise, rigorous, logical, 
They like everything chopped up and clear. Goo people like it vague. For example, in physics, prickly people believe that the ultimate constituents of matter are particles. Goo people believe it's waves. And uh, in, in uh, philosophy, prickly people are logical positivists and goo people are idealists. And they're always arguing with each other. And what they don't realize is that they, neither one can take his position without the other person. Because you wouldn't know you advocated prickles unless there was somebody else advocating goo. <laughs> you wouldn't know what a prickle was unless you knew what goo was. Because life is not either prickles or goo, it's gooey prickles and prickly goo. <laughs> and they go together like back and front, male and female. And that's the answer to philosophy. See, I'm a philosopher and I'm not going to argue very much because if you don't argue with me, I don't know what I think. <laughs> So if we argue, I say thank you, because uh, going to the courtesy of your taking a different point of view, I understand what I mean, so I can't get rid of you. But however, you see, this whole idea that the universe is just nothing at all but unintelligent force playing around and not even enjoying it, is a put-down theory of the world. People who had a, an advantage to make a game to play by putting it down and making out that because they put the world down, they were a superior kind of people. So uh, that just won't do. Uh, we've had it because if, if you seriously go along with this idea of the world, you are what is technically called alienated. You feel hostile to the world. You feel that the world is a trap. It is a a mechanism, it's electronic and neurological uh, mechanisms into which you somehow got caught. And you, poor thing, have to put up with being in a body that's falling apart and uh, that gets cancer, that gets uh, uh, the great Siberian itch, and uh, it's just terrible. And these mechanics, doctors, are trying to help you out, but they really can't succeed in the end. And you're just going to fall apart, and it's a grim business, and it's too bad. So if you think that that's the way things are, you may as well commit suicide right now. <laughs> Unless you say, well, I don't. Because there really, after all, there might be eternal damnation <laughs> in the back of the thing if I did that. Or uh, then I identify with my children or something, and I think of them going on and without me and uh, nobody to support them. But of course, if I do go on in this frame of mind and continue to support them, I shall merely teach them to be like I am. And they'll go on dragging it out to support their children, and they won't enjoy it, and they'll be afraid to commit suicide, and so will their children. <laughs> they all learn the same lesson. So you see, all I'm trying to say is that the basic common sense about the nature of the world that is influencing most people in the United States today, the fully automatic model, is simply a myth. If you want to say that the idea of God the Father with his white beard on the golden throne is a myth, in the bad sense of the word myth, so is this other one. It's just as phony and has just as little to support it as being the true state of affairs. Why? And let's get this clear. If there is any such thing at all as intelligence and love and beauty, well, you found it in other people. In other words, it exists in us as human beings. And as I said, if it is there, in us, it is symptomatic of the scheme of things. We are as symptomatic of the scheme of things as the apples are symptomatic of the apple tree or the rose of the rose bush. The earth is not a big rock infested with living organisms any more than your skeleton is bones infested with cells. The earth 
is geological, yes, but this geological entity grows people. And our existence on the earth is a symptom of the solar system and its balances, as much as the solar system in turn is a symptom of our galaxy. And our galaxy in its turn is a symptom of the whole company of galaxies. Goodness only knows what that's in. But you see, when as a scientist you describe the behavior of a living organism, you try to say what a person does. It's the only way in which you can describe what a person is. Describe what they do. Then you find out that in making this description, you cannot confine yourself to what happens inside the skin. In other words, you can't talk about a person walking unless you start describing the floor. Because when I walk, I don't just dangle my legs in empty space. I move in relationship to a room. And so in order to describe what I'm doing when I'm walking, I have to describe the room. I have to describe the territory. So in, in, in de describing my talking at the moment, I can't describe this just as a thing in itself because I'm talking to you. And so what I'm doing at the moment is not completely described unless your being here is described also. So if that is necessary, if in other words, in order to describe my behavior, I have to describe your behavior and the behavior of the environment, it means that we've really got one system of behavior. That what I am involves what you are. I don't know who I am unless I know who you are. And you don't know who you are unless you know who I am. There was a wise rabbi once said, if I am I because you are you, and you are you because I am I, then I am not I and you are not you. In other words, we are not separate. We define each other. We're all backs and fronts to each other. You know, uh, you can't, for example, have two sticks you lean two sticks against each other and they stand up because they support each other. Take one away and the other falls. They interdepend. And so in exactly that way, we and our environment and all of us and each other are interdependent systems. <coughs> we know who we are in terms of other people. We all lock together. And this is again and again the serious scientific description of how things happen. And any good scientist knows, therefore, that what you call the external world is as much you as your own body. Your skin doesn't separate you from the world, it's a bridge through which the external world flows into you and you flow into it. Just, for example, as a whirlpool in water, you could say, because you have a skin, you have a definite shape, you have a definite form, all right? Here is a, a flow of water, and it suddenly, it does a whirlpool. And then it goes on. The whirlpool is a definite form, but no water stays put in it. The whirlpool is something the stream is doing. And exactly the same way, the whole universe is doing each one of us. And I see you today, and I recognize you tomorrow just as I would recognize a whirlpool in a stream. I'd say, oh yes, I've seen that whirlpool before. It's just near so-and-so's house on the edge of the river, and it's always there. So in the same way, when I meet you tomorrow, I recognize you, you're the same whirlpool you were yesterday. But you're moving. The whole world is moving through you. All the cosmic rays, all the food you're eating, the stream of steaks and milk and uh, eggs and uh, uh, everything is just flowing right through you. When you're wiggling the same way, the world is wiggling, the stream is wiggling you. But the problem is, you see, we haven't been taught to feel that way. The myths underlying our culture and underlying our common sense have not taught us to feel identical with the universe, but only parts of it, only in it, only confronting it, aliens. And we are, I think, quite urgently 
in need of coming to feel that we are the eternal universe, each one of us. Otherwise, we're going to go out of our heads. We're going to commit suicide, collectively, with courtesy of H-bombs. And, uh, all right, supposing we do, well, that will be that, and there will be life making experiments on other galaxies. Maybe they'll find a better game. Out of Your Mind now continues with the next lecture from the Nature of Consciousness lecture series. Well now, I was discussing two of the great myths or models of the universe which lie in the intellectual and psychological background of all of us. The myth of the world as a political, monarchical state in which we are all here on sufferance as subjects of God, in which we are made artifacts who do not exist in our own right. God alone, in the first myth, exists in his own right. And you exist as a favor. And you ought to be grateful. It's like your parents come on and say to you, maybe, look at all the things we've done for you, all the money we spent to send you to college and uh, you turn out to be a beatnik. You're a wretched, ungrateful child. And you're supposed to uh, say, sorry, but um, I really am. But you're, you're definitely in the position of being on probation. So that, that idea of the royal God, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, which we inherit from the political structures of the Tigris-Euphrates cultures and from Egypt. The pharaoh, Amenhotep IV, is probably, as Freud suggested, the original author of Moses' monotheism. And the, certainly the Jewish law code comes from Hammurabi in Chaldea. And these men lived in a culture where the pyramid and the ziggurat, the ziggurat is a Chaldean version of the pyramid, indicating somehow a hierarchy of power from the boss all the way down. And God in this first myth that we've been discussing, the ceramic myth, is the boss. And the idea of God is that the universe is governed from above. But you see, this parallels and goes hand in hand with the idea that you govern your own body. That the ego, which lies somewhere between the ears and behind the eyes in the brain, is the governor of the body. And so we can't understand an assist, a system of order, a system of life in which there isn't a governor. O Lord, our governor, how excellent is thy name in all the world. But supposing, on the contrary, there could be a system which doesn't have a governor. That's what we are supposed to have in this society. We are supposed to be a democracy and a republic. And we are supposed to govern ourselves. And yet, as I said, it's so funny that Americans can be politically Republican. I don't mean Republican in the party sense. And yet, religiously monarchical. It's a real strange contradiction. 
So what is this universe? Is it a monarchy? Is it a republic? Is it a mechanism or an organism? Because you see, if it's a mechanism, either it's a, a mere mechanism, as in the fully automatic model, or else it's the mechanism under the control of a driver, a mechanic. If it's not that, it's an organism. And an organism is a thing that governs itself. In your body, there is no boss. You can say, you can argue, for example, that the brain is a gadget evolved by the stomach in order to serve the stomach for the purposes of getting food. Or you can argue that the stomach is a gadget evolved by the brain to feed it and keep it alive. Whose game is this? Is it the brain's game or the stomach's game? It doesn't make, actually, they're, they're mutual. The brain implies the stomach, the stomach implies the brain, and neither of them is the boss. You know that story about all the limbs of the body? Said, uh, the hands said, we, we do all our work, the feet said, we do our work, the mouth said, we do all the chewing, and here's this lazy stomach who just gets it all and doesn't do a thing. He doesn't do any work, so let's go on strike. And the hands refused to carry, the feet refused to walk, the mouth refused to chew and said, now, we're on strike against the stomach. But after a while, all of them found themselves getting weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker because they didn't recognize that the stomach fed them. So, there is the possibility then that we are not in the kind of system that these two myths delineate that we are not living in a world where we ourselves, in the deepest sense of, our, of self, are outside reality and somehow in a position that we have to bow down to it and say, as a great favor, please preserve us in existence. Nor are we in a system which is merely mechanical, and in which we are nothing but flukes trapped in the electrical wiring of a nervous system which is fundamentally rather inefficiently arranged. What's the alternative? Well, we can put the alternative in another image altogether. And I will call this not the ceramic image, not the fully automatic image, but the dramatic image. Consider the world as a drama. What's the basis of all drama? The basis of all stories, of all plots, of all happenings. It's the game of hide and seek. You get a baby, what's the fundamental first game you play with a baby? You put a book in front of your face and you peek at the baby like this. The baby starts giggling. Because the baby is close to the origins of life. It comes from the womb really knowing what it's all about, but it can't put it into words. See, what every child psychologist really wants to know is to get a baby to talk psychological jargon and explain how it feels. <laughs> But the baby knows. You do this and this, 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 and the baby starts laughing. Because the baby is a recent incarnation of God. And the baby knows, therefore, that hide and seek is the basic game. See, before, uh, when we were children, we were taught one, two, three, and ABC. But we weren't sat down on our mother's knees and taught the game of black and white. That's the thing that was left out of all our educations. That life is not a conflict between opposites, but a polarity. The difference between a conflict and a polarity is simply 
When you say about opposite things, we sometimes use the expression, these two things are the poles apart. You say, for example, with someone with whom you totally disagree, I'm the poles apart from this person. But your very saying that gives the show away. Poles. Poles are the opposite ends of one magnet. And if you take a magnet, there's a North Pole and a South Pole. All right, chop off the South Pole, move it away. The piece you've got left creates a new South Pole. You never get rid of the South Pole. Things may be the poles apart, but they go together. And you can't have the one without the other. That's the basic idea of polarity. But what we are trying to imagine is the encounter of forces that come from absolutely opposed realms that have nothing in common. When we say of two personality types that they're the poles apart. We are trying to think eccentrically instead of concentrically. And so in this way, we haven't realized that life and death, black and white, good and evil, being and non-being, come from the same center. They imply each other so that you wouldn't know the one without the other. Now, I'm not saying that that's bad. That's fun. You are playing the game that you don't know that self and other go together in just the same way as the two poles of a magnet. So that when anybody in our culture says, uh, slips into the state of consciousness where they suddenly find this to be true and they come on and say, I'm God, we say you're insane. Now, it's very difficult. You, you can very easily slip into the state of consciousness where you feel you're God. It can happen to anyone. Just in the same way as you can get the flu or uh, measles or something like that, you can slip into the state of consciousness. When you get it, it depends upon your background and your training as to how you're going to interpret it. If you've got the idea of God, that comes from popular Christianity. God as the governor, the political head of the world, and you think you're God, then you say to everybody, well, you should bow down and worship me. But if you're a member of Hindu culture, and you suddenly tell all your friends I'm God, instead of saying you're insane, they say, congratulations, at last you found out. Because their idea of God is not the autocratic governor. When they uh, make images of Shiva, say he has ten arms, how would you use ten arms? It's hard enough to use two. You know, if you play the organ, you've got to use your two feet and your two hands, and you play different rhythms with each member. It's kind of tricky. But actually, we're all masters at this. Because how do you grow each hair without having to think about it? Each nerve. How do you beat your heart and digest with your stomach at the same time? You don't have to think about it. In your very body, you are omnipotent in the true sense of omnipotence, which is that you are able to be omnipotent. You are able to do all these things without having to think about it. When I was a child, I used to ask my mother, of course, all sorts of ridiculous questions that every child asks. And when she got bored with my question, she'd say, darling, there are some things we're just not meant to know. Well, I said, will we ever know? She said, yes, of course, when we die and go to heaven, every God will make everything plain. So I used to imagine that on wet afternoons in heaven, we'd all sit around the throne of grace and say to God, well, now, why did you do this? And how did you do that? And he would explain it to us. Heavenly Father, why are the leaves green? And he would say, because of the chlorophyll. And we'd say, oh. <laughs> but in the Hindu universe, you would say to God, 
how did you make the mountains? And he would say, well, I just did it. Because what you're asking me for, when you ask me how did I make the mountains, you're asking me to describe in words how I made the mountains. And there are no words which can do this. Words cannot tell you how I made the mountains any more than I can drink the ocean with a fork. A fork may be useful for sticking into a piece of something and eating it, but it won't, it is, is no use for, for, for imbibing the ocean. It would take millions of years. So it would take millions of years. In other words, you would be bored with my description long before I got through it, if I put it to you in words. Because I didn't create the mountains with words. I just did it. Like you open and close your hand. You know how to do this, but can you describe in words how you do it? But you do it. You are conscious, aren't you? Do you know how you manage to be conscious? Do you know how you beat your heart? Can you say in words, explain correctly how this is done? You do it, but you can't put it into words because words are too clumsy. And yet you manage this expertly for as long as you're able to do it. This concludes session one of Out of Your Mind, Essential Listening from the Alan Watts Audio Archives. Our program continues with session two. True presents Out of Your Mind, Essential Listening from the Alan Watts Audio Archives, Session 2, The Nature of Consciousness, Part 2 with Alan Watts. We are playing a game. And the game runs like this. The only thing you really know is what you can put into words. Let's suppose I love some girl, rapturously. And somebody says to me, would you really love her? Or well, how am I going to prove this? Well, I say, uh, write poetry. Tell us all how much you love her, then we'll believe you. So if I'm an artist and I can put this into words and convince everybody that I've written the most ecstatic love letters ever written, they say, all right, okay, we, we'll admit it, you really do love her. But supposing you're not very articulate, are we going to tell you you don't love her? Surely not. You don't have to be Heloise and Abelard to be in love. So. The whole game that our culture is playing is that nothing really happens unless it's in the newspaper. So we're, when we are at a party and there's a great party, somebody said, it's too bad there wasn't a tape recorder. And so our children begin to feel that they don't exist authentically unless they get their names in the papers. And the fastest way of getting your name in the papers is to commit a crime. And then you'll be photographed, then you'll appear in court, then everybody will notice you. It really happened if it was recorded. In other words, if you shout and it doesn't, doesn't come back an echo, it didn't happen. Well, that's a real hang-up. It's true, the fun with echoes. We all like singing in the bathtub because there's more resonance there. And when we play a musical instrument like a violin or a cello, it has a sounding box because that gives resonance to the sound. And in the same way, the cortex of the human brain enables us, when we are happy, to know that we are happy. And that gives a certain resonance to it. If you're happy and you don't know you're happy, there's nobody home. <laughs> but this is the whole problem for us. Several thousand years ago, human beings evolved the system of self-consciousness. And uh, they knew, they, they knew. 
There was a young man who said, though, it seems that I know that I know. What I would like to see is the eye that knows me when I know that I know that I know. You see? And, and this is uh, the human problem. We know that we know. And so there came a point in our evolution when we didn't guide life by just trusting our instincts and had to think about it and had to purposely arrange and discipline and push our lives around in accordance with foresight and words and systems of symbols, accountancy, calculation, and so on. And then we worry. Once you start thinking about things, you worry as to whether you've thought enough. Did you really take all the details into consideration? Was every fact properly reviewed? And by Jove, the more you think about it, the more you realize that uh, you really couldn't take everything into consideration because all the variables in any human decision are incalculable. So you get anxiety. And this, though, also, this is the price you pay for knowing that you know, for being able to think about thinking, to feel about feeling. And so you're in this funny position. Now then, do you see that this is simultaneously an advantage and a terrible disadvantage? What has happened here is that by having a certain kind of consciousness, a certain kind of reflexive consciousness, being aware of being aware, being able to represent what goes on fundamentally in terms of a system of symbols, such as words, such as numbers. You put, as it were, two lives together at once, one representing the other. The symbols representing the reality, the money representing the wealth, And if you don't realize that the symbol is really secondary, it doesn't have the same value. You know, people go to the supermarket and they uh, get a whole cartload of goodies and they drive it through. And then the clerk fixes up the counter and this long tape comes out. And you say, $30, please. And everybody feels depressed. Because <laughs> they, they give away $30 worth of paper, but they've got a cartload of goodies. They don't think about that. They think they just lost, lost $30. But you've got the real wealth in the cart. All you parted with was the paper. Because the paper in our system becomes more valuable than the wealth. It represents power, potentiality. Whereas the wealth, you think, oh well, that's just necessary. You've got to eat. Well, I mean, that's to be really mixed up. So then, if you awaken from this illusion and you understand that black implies white, self implies other, life implies death, or shall I say, Death implies life. You can feel yourself not as a stranger in the world, not as something here on probation, not as something that has arrived here by fluke, but you can begin to feel your own existence as absolutely fundamental. what you are basically. Deep, deep down, far, far in, is simply the fabric and structure of existence itself. So, say in Hindu mythology, they say that the world is the drama of God. God is not something in Hindu 
mythology with a white beard that sits on a throne and that has royal prerogatives. God in, in Indian mythology is the self, Satchitananda, which means Sat, that which is, Chit, that which is consciousness, that which is Ananda is bliss. And in other words, re, the, the, what exists, reality itself is gorgeous. It is the plenum, the fullness of total joy. Wow, we. And all those stars, if you look out in the sky, as a firework display, like you see on the 4th of July, which is a great occasion for celebration. The universe is a celebration. It is a firework show to celebrate that existence is. Wow, we. And then they say, but however, there's no point just in sustaining bliss. Let's suppose that you were able every night to dream any dream you wanted to dream. And that you could, for example, have the power within one night to dream 75 years of time. Or any length of time you wanted to have. And you would naturally, as you began on this adventure of dreams, you would fulfill all your wishes. You would have every kind of pleasure you could conceive. And after several nights of 75 years of total pleasure each, you would say, well, that was pretty great. But now let's, um, let's have a surprise. Let's have a dream which isn't under control. Well, something is going to happen to me that I don't know what it's going to be. And uh, you, you would dig that and come out of that and say, wow, that was a, a close shave, wasn't it? And then you would get more and more adventurous and you would make further and further out gambles as to what you would dream. And finally, you would dream where you are now. You would dream the dream of living the life that you are actually living today. That would be within the infinite multiplicity of choices you would have, of playing that you weren't God. Because the whole nature of the Godhead, according to this idea, is to play that he's not. The first thing he says to himself is, man, get lost. Because he gives himself away. The nature of love is self-abandonment, not clinging to oneself. Throwing yourself out, as in, for example, in basketball, you're always getting rid of the ball. You say to the other fellow, have a ball. See? And uh, that, that keeps things moving. That's the nature of life. So in this idea then, everybody is fundamentally the ultimate reality. Not God in a politically kingly sense, but God in the sense of being the self, the deep down basic whatever there is. And you're all that, only you're pretending you're not. And it's perfectly okay to pretend you're not, to be absolutely convinced, because this is the whole notion of drama. When you come into the theater, there is a proscenium arch and a stage, and down there is the audience. And everybody assumes their seats in the theater and uh, are going to see a comedy, a tragedy, a thriller, or whatever it is. And they all know as they come in and pay their admissions that what is going to happen on the stage is not for real. But the actors have a conspiracy against this because they are going to try and persuade the audience that what is happening on the stage is for real. They want to get everybody sitting on the edge of their chairs. They want to get you terrified or crying or laughing. Ab absolutely captivated by the drama. And if a skillful human actor can take in an audience and make people cry, think what the cosmic actor can do. Why, he can take himself in completely. He can play so much for real that he really believes it is. Like you sitting in this room, you think you're really here. Why, well, you've persuaded yourself that way. You've acted it so damn well that you know this is the real world. But you're playing it. It's because the audience and the actor is one. 
because behind the stage there's the green room off scene obscene where the actors take off their masks you know that the word person means mask the persona which is the mask worn by actors in greco-roman drama because it has a megaphone type mouth which throws the sound out in an open air theater so pair through sona what the sound comes through that's the mask how to be a real person how to be a genuine fake <laughs> a mask so the dramatis personae at the beginning of a play is the list of masks that the actors will wear and so in the course of forgetting that this this life is a drama the word for the role the word for the mask has come to mean who you are genuinely the person the proper person incidentally the word parson is derived from the word person <laughs> the person of the village person around town the parson it's funny so anyway then this is a drama i'm not trying to sell you on this idea in the sense of converting you to it i want you to play with it i want you to think of its possibilities i'm not trying to prove it i'm just putting it forward as a possibility of life to think about so then this means that you're not victims of a scheme of things of a mechanical world or of an autocratic god the life you're living is what you have put yourself into only you don't admit it because you want to play the game that it's happened to you in other words i got mixed up in this world my parents i had a father who got hot pants over a girl and she was my mother and uh, because he got the, he was just a he was just a horny old man and as a result of that i got born and i blame him for it and say well that's your fault you got to look after me and he says I don't see why I should look after you. You're just a result. <laughs> and, but let's suppose we admit that I really wanted to get born and that I was the ugly gleam in my father's eye when he approached my mother. That was me. I was desire. And I deliberately got involved in this thing. Look at it that way instead. and that even if i got myself into an awful mess and i got born with syphilis and the great siberian itch and tuberculosis and uh, in a nazi concentration camp nevertheless this was a game which was a very far out play it was a kind of cosmic masochism but i did it isn't that an optimal game rule for life Because if you play life on the supposition that you're a helpless little puppet that got involved, or if you play it on the supposition that it's a, a frightful, serious risk, and that we really ought to do something about it, and uh, so on, it's a drag. <laughs> There's no point in going on living unless we make the assumption that the situation of life is optimal. that really and truly we are all in a state of total bliss and delight but we are going to pretend we aren't just for kicks you play non bliss in order to be able to experience bliss and you can go as far out as non bliss as you want to go and when you wake up it'll be great you know you can slam yourself on the head with a hammer because it's so nice when you stop and it makes you realize you see how how great things are when you forget that that's the way it is and that's just like black and white you don't know black unless you know white you don't know white unless you know black this is simply fundamental so then here's the drama my metaphysics let me be perfectly frank with you are that there is the central self you can call it god you can call it anything you like and it's all of us it's playing all the parts of all 
beings whatsoever, everywhere and anywhere. And it's playing the game of hide and seek with itself. It gets lost, it gets involved in the farest out adventures, but in the end, it always wakes up and comes back to itself. And when you're ready to wake up, you're going to wake up. And if you're not ready, you're going to stay pretending that you're just a little, poor little me. And uh, since you're all here and engaged in this sort of inquiry and listening to this sort of lecture, I assume that you're all on the process of waking up. Or else you're teasing yourselves with some kind of uh, flirtation with waking up, which you're not serious about. But I assume yeah, maybe you are not serious but sincere, that you are ready to wake up. So then, when you're in the way of waking up and finding out who you really are, you meet a character called a guru. As the Hindus say, this word, the teacher, the awakener. And what is the function of a guru? He's the man who looks at you in the eye and says, oh, come off it. <laughs> I know who you are. You know, you come to the guru and say, sir, I have a problem. I'm unhappy and I want to get one up on the universe or I want to become enlightened. I want spiritual wisdom. Ah, and the guru looks at you and says, who are you? You know, Sri Ramana Maharshi, that great Hindu sage, of modern times, people used to come to him and say, Master, who was I in my last incarnation? As if that mattered. And he would say, who is asking the question? And he'd look at you and say, basically, go right down to it. You're looking at me, you're looking out, and you're unaware of what's behind your eyes. Go back in and find out who you are, where the question comes from, why you ask. And if you've looked at a photograph of that man, I have a gorgeous photograph of him. And you look in those, I walk by it every time I go out of the front door. And I look at those eyes and the humor in them, the lilting laugh that says, oh, come off it, man. <laughs> Shiva, I recognize you. When you come to my door and you say, I'm so-and-so, I say, ha ha, what a funny way God has come on today. <laughs> uh, there are all sorts of tricks, of course, that gurus play. They uh, say, well, we're going to put you through the mill. And the reason they do that is simply that you won't wake up until you feel you've paid a price for it. In other words, the sense of guilt that one has, or the sense of anxiety, is simply the way one experiences keeping the game of disguise going on. Do you see that? Supposing you say, I feel guilty. Christianity makes you feel guilty for existing. That somehow, the very fact that you exist is an affront. You are a fallen human being. I remember as a child when we went to the services of the church on Good Friday, they gave us each a colored postcard with Jesus crucified on it. And it said underneath, this have I done for thee, what doest thou for me? You know, you felt awful. You nailed that man to the cross. Because you eat steak, you have crucified Christ because they kill the bull. After all, you depend on it. Mithra, it's the same mystery. And what are you going to do about that? This have I done for thee, what doest thou for me? You feel awful that you just exist at all. But that sense, that sense of guilt is the veil across the sanctuary. Don't you dare come in. In order to, you know, in all mysteries, when you're going to be initiated, there's somebody saying, ah, 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 don't you come in. You've got to fulfill this requirement, and this requirement, and this requirement, and this requirement, then we'll let you in. 
And so you go, you, you go through the mill. Why? Because this is, you are saying to yourself, I won't wake up until I feel I deserve it. I won't wake up until I've made it difficult for me to wake up. So I, I, I invent for myself an elaborate system of delaying my waking up. I put myself through this test and that test, and when I feel it's been sufficiently arduous, then I may at last admit to myself who I really am and draw aside the veil and realize that after all, when all is said and done, I am that I am, which is the name of God. And when it comes to it, that's really rather funny. They say in Zen, when you attain Satori, nothing is left to you at that moment but to have a good laugh. But naturally, uh, all masters, Zen masters, yoga masters, every kind of master, uh, puts up a barrier and says to you, He simply plays your own game. You know, we say anybody who goes to a psychiatrist ought to have his head examined. Because you, when you go to a psychiatrist, you define yourself as somebody who ought to have his head examined. Same way, uh, the Zen masters say anybody who studies Zen or comes to a Zen master ought to be given 30 blows with a stick. Because he was stupid enough to pose the question, that he had a problem. But you're the problem. You, you put yourself in this situation. So it's a question fundamentally. Do you define yourself as a victim of the world or as the world? You can define yourself. You see, if you identify you with what you call the voluntary system of the nerves, and say, only that's me. And that's really a rather limited amount of my total performance, what I do voluntarily. Then you've defined yourself as the victim in the game. And so you are able to feel that life was a trap. Something else, whether it was God or whether it was fate or whether it was uh, the, the big mechanism, the system, imposed this on you. And you can say, poor little me. But you can equally well, and with just as much justification, define yourself not only as what you do voluntarily, but also what you do involuntarily. That's you too. Do you beat your heart or don't you? Or does it just happen to you? And if you define yourself as the works, then nobody's imposing on you. You're not a victim. You're doing it. Because you can't explain how you do it in words, because words are too clumsy. And it takes too long to say. You get bored with it. But actually, then you can say, with, with gusto, I am responsible for this life. Whether comedy or tragedy, I did it. And it seems to me that that is a basis for behavior and going on, which is more fundamentally joyous and profitable and uh, great than defining ourselves as miserable victims or sinners or what have you. Out of Your Mind now continues with the next lecture from the Nature of Consciousness lecture series. I was discussing an alternative myth to the ceramic and fully automatic models of the universe. I'll call the dramatic myth. The idea that life as we experience it's a big act and that behind this big act 
is the player. And uh, the player, or the self as it's called in Hindu philosophy, the Atman, is you. Only you are playing hide and seek, since that is the essential game that's going on. It's the game of games, it's the basis of all games, hide and seek. And so since you're playing hide and seek, you are deliberately, although you can't admit this, or won't admit it, you are deliberately forgetting who you really are, or what you really are, and the knowledge that your essential self is the foundation of the universe, the ground of being, as Tillich calls it, is something you have as what the Germans call a Hintergedanke. A Hintergedanke is a thought way, way, way in the back of your mind, way back here somewhere. Something that you know deep down, but uh, can't admit. So, in a way then, in, in order to bring this to the front, in order to know that that is the case, you have to be kitted out of your game. You see, the problem is this. We identify in our experience a differentiation between what we do and what happens to us. We have a certain number of actions that we define as voluntary. and We feel in control of those. And then over against that, there is uh, all those things that are involuntary. But the dividing line between these two is very arbitrary. Because, for example, when you uh, move your hand, you feel that you decide whether to open it or to close it. But then ask yourself, how do you decide? When you decide to open your hand, do you first decide to decide? You don't, do you? You just decide, and how do you do that? And if you don't know how you do it, is it voluntary or involuntary? Let's consider breathing. You can feel that you breathe deliberately. You can control your breath. But when you don't think about it, it goes on. Is it voluntary or involuntary? And so we come to have a very arbitrary definition of self. That much of my activity, which I feel I do. And that then doesn't include breathing most of the time. It doesn't include the heartbeats. It doesn't include uh, the activity of the glands. It doesn't include digestion. It doesn't include how you shape your bones, circulate your blood. Do you or do you not do these things? Now, if you get with yourself <clears throat> and you find out that you are all of yourself, a very strange thing happens. You find that your body knows that you are one with the universe. In other words, that the so-called involuntary circulation of your blood is one continuous process with the stars shining. If you find out that it's you who circulates your blood, you will at the same moment find out that you are shining the sun. Because your physical organism is one continuous process with everything else that's going on. Just as the waves are continuous with the ocean, your body is continuous with the total energy system of the cosmos. And it's all you. Only you're playing the game that you're only this bit of it. But as I tried to explain, there are in physical reality no such things as separate events. So then, remember also when I tried to work towards a definition of omnipotence. Omnipotence is not knowing how everything is done, it's just doing it. You don't have to translate it into language. Look, supposing when you got up in the morning, you had to switch your brain on. And you had to think and do as a deliberate process, waking up all the circuits 
that you need for active life during the day. Why, you'd never get done. Because you have to do all those things at once. How can a centipede control a hundred legs at once? Because it doesn't think about it. And so in the same way, you are unconsciously performing all the various activities of your organism. Only unconsciously isn't a good word because it sounds sort of dead. Superconsciously would be better. Give it a plus rather than a minus. Because what a consciousness is, is simply a sort of specialized form of awareness. When you uh, look around the room, you are conscious of as much as you can notice. And you see an enormous number of things which you don't notice. If, for example, I look at a girl here and somebody asks me later, what was she wearing? I may not know, although I've seen, because I didn't attend. But I was aware, you see. And perhaps if I could, uh, under hypnosis, be asked this question, where I would get my conscious attention out of the way be, through being in the hypnotic state, I could recall what dress she was wearing. So then, just in the same way as you don't focus your attention on how you make your thyroid gland function, so in the same way you don't have any attention focused on how you shine the sun. So then, let me connect this with the problem of birth and death which puzzles people enormously, of course. Because in order to understand what, what the self is, you have to remember that it doesn't need to remember anything. Just like you don't need to know how you work your thyroid gland. So then, when you die, you're not going to have to put up with everlasting non-existence because that's not an experience. A lot of people are afraid that when they die, they're going to be locked up in a dark room forever and, and sort of undergo that. But one of the most interesting things in the world, this is a yoga, this is a way of realization. Try and imagine what it will be like to go to sleep and never wake up. Think about that. Children think about it. It's one of the great wonders of life. What will it be like to go to sleep and never wake up? And if you think long enough about that, something will happen to you. You will find out, among other things, that uh, it will pose the next question to you. What was it like to wake up after having never gone to sleep? That was when you were born. You see, you, you can't have an experience of nothing. Nature abhors a vacuum. So after you're dead, the only thing that can happen is the same experience or the same sort of experience as when you were born. In other words, we all know very well that after people die, other people are born. And they're all you. Only you can only experience it one at a time. Everybody is I. You all know you are you. And wheresoever beings exist throughout all galaxies, it doesn't make any difference. You are all of them. And when they come into being, that's you coming into being. You know that very well. Only you don't have to remember the past in the same way you don't have to think about how you work your thyroid gland or whatever else it is in your organism. You don't have to know how to shine the sun. You just do it. Like you breathe. Isn't it, doesn't it really astonish you that you are this fantastically complex thing? And that you're doing all of this and you never had any education in how to do it? You never learned, but you're this miracle? Well, the point is that from a strictly physical, scientific standpoint, this organism is a continuous energy with everything else that's going on. And if I am my foot, I am the sun. 
Only we've got this little partial view, we've got the idea that no, I'm just something in this body. The ego. That's a joke. The ego is nothing other than the focus of conscious attention. It's like a radar on a ship. The radar on a ship is a troubleshooter. Is there anything in the way? And conscious attention is a designed function of the brain to scan the environment, like a radar does. And note for any troublemaking changes. But if you identify yourself with your troubleshooter, then naturally you define yourself as being in a perpetual state of anxiety. <coughs> and the moment we cease to identify with the ego, and become aware that we are the whole organism, you realize the f as the first thing how harmonious it all is. Because your organism is a miracle of harmony. All this thing functioning together. Even those corpuscles and uh, creatures that are fighting each other in the bloodstream and eating each other up. If they weren't doing that, you wouldn't be healthy. So what is discord at one level of your being is harmony at a higher level. And you begin to realize that and you begin to be aware too that the discords of your life and the discords of people's life, which are a fight at one level, at a higher level of the universe, are healthy and harmonious. And you suddenly realize that everything that you are and do is at that level as magnificent and as free of any blemish as the patterns in waves. The markings in marble, the way a cat moves, and that this world is really okay. It can't be anything else because otherwise it couldn't exist. But the reality underneath physical existence, or which really is physical existence, because in my philosophy there's no difference between the physical and the spiritual. These are absolutely out of date categories. It's all process. It isn't stuff on the one hand and form on the other. It's just, it is pattern. Life is pattern. It is a dance of energy. So I will never invoke spooky knowledge. Uh, that is to say that I've had a private revelation or that I have sensory vibrations going on a plane which you don't have. Everything is standing right out in the open. And it's just a question of how you look at it. So you do discover when you realize this the most extraordinary thing to me that I never cease to be flabbergasted at whenever it happens to me. Some people will use a symbolism of the relationship of God to the universe, wherein God is, say, brilliant light, only somehow veiled, hiding underneath all these forms that you see as you look around you. So far, so good. But the truth is funnier than that. It is that you are looking right at the brilliant light now. That the experience you are having, which you call ordinary everyday consciousness, pretending you're not it, that experience is exactly the same thing as it. There's no difference at all. And when you find that out, you laugh yourself silly. <laughs> That's the great discovery. In other words, when you really start to see things and you look at an old paper cup and you go into the nature of what it is to see, what vision is, or what smell is, or what touch is, you realize that that vision of the paper cup is the brilliant light of the cosmos. Nothing could be brighter. 10,000 suns couldn't be brighter. Only they are hidden in the sense that all the points of the infinite light are so tiny when you see them in the cup. They don't blow your eyes out. But it is actually, see, the source of all light is in the eye. If there were no eyes in this world, the sun would not be light. You evoke light out of the universe. 
In the same way, you, by virtue of having a soft skin, evoke hardness out of wood. Wood is only hard in relation to a soft skin. It's your eardrum that evokes noise out of the air. You, by being this organism, call into being the whole universe of light and color and hardness and heaviness and everything, you see? Uh, but in, in the mythology that we've sold ourselves on during the end of the 19th century, when people discovered how big the universe was, and that we live on a little planet in a solar system on the edge of a galaxy, which is a minor galaxy, everybody thought, ah, oh, we're really unimportant after all. God isn't there and doesn't love us and nature doesn't give a damn. And uh, we put ourselves down, you see? But actually, it's this little funny microbe, tiny thing, crawling on this little planet that's way out somewhere, who has the ingenuity by nature of this magnificent organic structure to evoke the whole universe out of what would otherwise be mere quanta. There's jazz going on. But you see, this little, little ingenious organism is not merely some stranger in this. This little organism on this little planet is what the whole show is growing there and so realizing its own presence. Well, now here's the problem. If this is the state of affairs, which is so, and if the, the consciousness state you are in at this moment is the same thing as what we might call the divine state, if you do anything to make it different, it shows you don't understand that it's so. So the moment you start practicing yoga, or praying, or meditating, or indulging in some sort of spiritual cultivation, you are getting in your own way. The Buddha said, we suffer because we desire. If you can give up desire, you won't suffer. But he didn't say that as the last word. He said that as the opening step of a dialogue. Because the, if, he, if you say that to someone, they're going to come back after a while and say, yes, but I'm now desiring not to desire. <laughs> and so the Buddha will answer, well, at last you're beginning to understand the point. Because you can't give up desire. Why would you try to do that? It's already desire. So in the same way, you say, uh, you ought to be unselfish or to give up your ego. Let go, relax. Why do you want to do that? Just because it's another way of beating the game, isn't it? But the moment you see you hypothesize that you are different from the universe, you want to get one up on it. But if you try to get one up on the universe and you're in competition with it, it means you don't understand you are it. You think there's a real difference between self and other. But self, what you call yourself and what you call other, are mutually necessary to each other, like back and front. They're really one. But just as a magnet polarizes itself in north and south, but it's all one magnet, so experience polarizes itself as self and other, but it's all one. So if you try to make the North Pole get the mastery of it, or the South Pole get the mastery of the North Pole, you show you don't know what's going on. A guru or teacher who wants to get this across to somebody, because he knows it himself, and when you know it, you know, you like others to see it too. So what he does is he gets you into being ridiculous harder and more assiduously than usual. In other words, if you are in a contest with the universe, he's going to stir up that contest until it becomes ridiculous. And so he sets you such tasks as saying, now of course, in order to be a true person, you must give up yourself. Be unselfish. So the Lord sits, uh, steps down out of heaven and says, the first and great commandment is, thou shalt love the Lord thy God. You must love me. Well, that's a double bind. You can't love on purpose. You can't be 
sincere, purposely. It's like trying not to think of a green elephant while taking medicine. <laughs> but if a person really tries to do it, so, you know, this is the way Christianity is rigged, you should be very sorry for your sins. And though everybody knows they're not, but they think they ought to be, and so they go around trying to be penitent, or trying to be humble. And they know the more assiduously they practice it, the phonier and phonier the whole thing gets. And so in this way, it's, a, what, it's called a, the technique of reductio ad absurdum. If you think you have a problem, you see, and that you're an ego and that you're in difficulty, the answer that the Zen master makes to you is, show me your ego. I want to see this thing that has a problem. When Bodhidharma, the legendary founder of Zen, came to China, a disciple came to him and said, I have no peace of mind. Please pacify my mind. And Bodhidharma said, bring out your mind here before me and I'll pacify it. Well, he said, when I look for it, I can't find it. So Bodhidharma said, there, it's pacified. See, because when you look for your own mind, that is to say your own particularized center of being, which is separate from everything else, you won't be able to find it. But the only way you'll know it isn't there is if you look for it hard enough to find out that it isn't there. And so everybody says, all right, know yourself, look within, find out who you are. Because the harder you look, you won't be able to find it. And then you'll realize that it isn't there at all. There isn't a separate you. Your mind is what there is. Everything. But the only way to find that out is to persist in the state of delusion as hard as possible. That's one way. I don't say the only way, but it is one way. And so almost all spiritual disciplines, meditations, prayers, etc., etc., are ways of persisting in folly, doing resolutely and consistently what you're doing already. So if a person believes that the earth is flat, you can't talk him out of that. He knows it's flat. Look out of the window and see it. Obviously it looks flat. So the only way to convince him that it isn't is to say, well, let's go and find the edge. And in order to find the edge, you've got to be very careful not to walk in circles. You'll never find it that way. So we've got to go consistently in a straight line, due west, along the same line of latitude. And eventually, when we get back to where we started from, you've convinced the guy that the earth is round. But that's the, that's the only way that'll, tell, that'll teach him. Because people can't be talked out of illusions. But well, now there is another possibility, however. But this is more difficult to describe. Let's say uh, we, we take as the basic supposition, which is the thing that one sees in the experience of satori or, or awakening or whatever you want to call it, that this now moment in which I'm talking and you're listening is eternity. That although we have somehow conned ourselves into the notion that this moment is rather ordinary and that we may not feel very well and that uh, we're sort of vaguely frustrated and worried and so on and that it ought to be changed. This is it. So you don't need to do anything at all. But the difficulty about explaining that is that don't, you, you mustn't try not to do 